How about a grand tour? Not of continents, but of science. Let's seek truth where it may change. Time, matter, energy, universe, earth, life, brain, mind. The cosmic spectrum of science. What discoveries lie ahead? What surprises are in store? What breakthroughs could make the largest impact? We get the big story about the structure of matter and energy, the beginnings and ends of the universe, the global changes on our planet, the development of life, and the essence of brain and mind. Next, on Closer to Truth, what are the great questions of science? Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm Robert Kuhn. Great science requires great questions. So for this program, we've brought together five world-renowned scientists and thinkers, and we've asked them to make a list. Dr. Steve Koonin is Vice President and Provost of Caltech, where he is Professor of Theoretical Physics. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist at Princeton, is director of the Hayden Planetarium of the American Museum of Natural History. Timothy Ferris is an award-winning author of science books and a consultant to NASA on long-term space policy. Dr. Francisco Ayala, professor of biology and philosophy at the University of California at Irvine, is called the Renaissance Man of Evolutionary Biology. And Dr. Patricia Churchland, is professor of philosophy at the University of California at San Diego, where she focuses on neuroscience. Steve, as provost of Caltech, one of the world's great scientific organizations, of course, you are responsible for all of its research. Uh, do great questions drive great scientists? Yes, I think they do, Robert. You know, science is about figuring out how the world works. And there are really two kinds of science. One is where you, you kind of know the rules, but you're figuring out how they apply in some specific situation. Mm -hmm. And then there's another kind of science where you're really trying to figure out the rules themselves, all right? And so there have been revolutions, thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, relativity, uh, understanding the genetic code, for example, that really mm -hmm. changed the whole game. Yeah. And, and, you know, my uh, late colleague Dick Feynman used to say, once you know the rules, everything else yeah. is just chess. <laughs> and so it, it is figuring out those rules, I think, that are really the great questions in the universe. Well, what I find interesting about your own research is it ranges so broadly from computational nuclear physics right to uh, global change on the planet. What drives you? Gee, that, uh, <laughs> gee what does drive me? That's it. I, I think interesting questions and the possibility of being able to answer those mm. questions. You can't ask questions that are uh, too far out there. You, you want to mm. try to really uh, Solvable questions. pick questions that you can Good. solve. Good. We'll, right. we'll get to some of them. Okay. Neil, you are what I'd call a public scientist in, in a grand tradition, a professor of astrophysics at Princeton uh, and director of the Hayden Planetarium, which many of us got our first exposure to the universe. And has my first influenced. night sky. <laughs> right, <laughs> very <laughs> terrific. Uh, why are the, the grand questions of science important for the public? Well, not all scientists ever have the privilege of answering alone the grand questions of science, but it's the grand questions that are the carrot, the intellectual carrot that's put out there that actually seduce people to wanting to do science in the first place and they keep you going all throughout the journey. Mm. And often the, the fun of doing science is not even answering that great question, but it's, it's the path you take along the way. Mm. And it's that path that gets you closer to the machinery of how the world works. And, and that, that great question is always out there. The great question is, and once you solve that, there's going to be another question <laughs> on the other side of it. So don't, don't, don't be fooled by, <laughs> Some by how close so. you are. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get to that too. Tim, uh, you're a journalist, a, a superb writer of elegant and insightful books on astronomy, such as the whole shebang. Why, why do you think so many of these great questions skew to physics and astronomy? Well, physics, uh, because it, it looks at the foundations, the very smallest things, and astronomy, because it looks at the other end of the scale, the very largest. And within that uh, framework is every phenomenon that, uh, that we know about and that we are. Francisco, I, I need your help. And Pat, I feel like I'm surrounded by astronomers and physicists and astronomy. Uh, let's have a little bit of biology here. Why is it now 
that people, when they're asking great questions, are now making more of a, in the direction of biology? Because a major breakthrough only happened in the 19th century. You know, only after Darwin can we ask the fundamental questions of biology. Mm. Before that, uh, you know, birds have wings and, and uh, we have lungs, but there was no explanation for that. Mm. And they were attributed to the creator. Since Darwin, we have been able to ask all the important questions as to where we come from, why we work the way we work, our bodies, and everything else, and how we relate to each other. And as time is going on, more and more of these questions are biologically based. Absolutely. And, and of course, after all, biology deals with, the, with living organisms, which with all due respect to all the physicists and astronomers are the most interesting <laughs> and the most diversified things in the world. <laughs> so we have there a field uh, to, to study and to investigate for a long time. Pat, you're one of the leading thinkers about the brain-mind, traditionally called the mind-body problem. Uh, though I'm expressing my own prejudice early, uh, tell me why the brain and the mind must be, must be, among the great questions of science. Well, I think there are a number of different questions that we want to separate here. Um, one question has to do with whether psychological states, our mental life, remembering, thinking, creating, whether that is really a subset of brain activity or not. And on that major question, I think, although there are residual problems, I think largely people agree that it is only the brain, that there isn't anything in addition to the brain, such as a non-physical soul. I say some people agree with that. I think, by and large, scientists do, and I think that's really the way the evidence stacks up now in neuroscience. It's possible um, that there is a non-physical soul, but it doesn't really look like that's the way uh, things work. But the other sort of major question that you want to ask, given that framework then, is how is it that high-level psychological effects come about from basic neural effects? How is it that you've got these cells organized in this complex way and they give rise to my seeing motion or my seeing color or my smelling a rose? And I think that those are the questions that certainly preoccupy me at this stage. Right. Well, we want to get to that later, but let's start at the fundamental aspect. Remember what we're going to do? We're going to go through this category. We're going to do physics, astronomy, earth, life, including evolution, and then brain and mind. So I want to start with physics. What are the great questions of physics? I want to start with Steve. Well, that, that's, uh, I think there are several interesting questions right now at the forefront. One is we have a picture of the physical world called the standard model. It's got quarks, it's got leptons in it, it's got gauge bosons. And, and the question, Quarks being the quarks most fundamental be, part? Well, together with the leptons, that's right. right, being the most fundamental parts of, of matter. And the question is, to what extent is that standard model valid? It, so far, it has proven maddeningly valid. Everywhere we look to test it, it seems to be right. But it's got some free parameters in it, some things that we have to go out and measure. What are the values of the fine structure constant, for example? We would like to know how many free parameters are there, what are those values, and are they all related in some way. Tim, you have looked at quantum questions in, in physics. Uh, tell us about those. Well, they, you know, physics in the end of the 20th century is uh, comprised of quantum physics and relativity. And as we've alluded to a little bit here, they're, they're not quite compatible. And there are aspects of the quantum world that um, are, are very challenging, difficult to understand. And amongst physicists that I've talked to, some feel that these questions won't ever be of any functional importance. Other than uh, the show. <laughs> other than that. And uh, others feel that, uh, that through this keyhole, there may be a great deal to be, to be seen. You know, if you look at the whole universe in quantum terms, it's quite interesting to think about light traveling all these distances and then striking your eye and suddenly turning into something different, a kind of knowledge or perception. And when we try to understand